Hi, everybody. Uh, happy Friday. Uh, a, a pretty extraordinary Friday, uh, I, I would say. Uh, the, something something has happened in our country that, that is rare and unusual. Um, and for many of us, hopefully all of us, very positive. Um, they just signed into effect a bill today that makes Juneteenth a, national, a federal holiday. Um, tomorrow is Juneteenth. It's the 19th of June. Um, it's the day that... Uh, Okay, it's the it's the day that um, the, the last slaves in our country in Texas were finally informed that they had been freed for a long, long time. It, uh, this country is very slow at moving a lot and about about a lot of things, um, but uh, yeah, I'm 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 proud that that we've done this. Um, it's good to have something to be proud of. There have been a lot of disappointments and frustrations for us in over the years. Um, but we're here to talk about what we've been through for the past year with COVID. Um, now that we're facing a new world, a live, a live performance may be coming back or is coming back. And uh, we've all been vaccinated or most of us, if not all of us. Um, so we're entering a new chapter. We're entering a new, a whole new world again. Uh, I, I have to actually relearn my social skills I have to actually figure out how to relate to people in person. I'm so used to Zoom now. Um, we've talked about how different people have responded to the pivot, the shutdown. You guys know that that True made a pivot uh, from doing everything live to me finally learning how to do Zoom and making sure that we we're able to pr pr provide our programs virtually. Um, and we've met a lot of people that have done different things virtually, including podcasts and oh, virtual productions and Zoom Zoom readings and all that. Uh, we've gotten through this world as best as we can, as, as gracefully as we can. Um, I, today, I want you to meet. Um, I want you to meet a guy who, uh, two, two guys actually, who created a, pl a platform. One of the things that we've always been searching for over the years, we're looking for the best platform for presenting our work and for developing our work. Um, so when I hear about something that I had that I didn't know before, I jump on it. I decide, you know, I want to meet these people. I want to find out more about them. I want to find out why they've done what they've done, how they've done what they've done, and what, what they can do for you. Um, so I'm actually going to bring them in now. And I'm going to introduce you to Mark Netter and Rafe Peters um, in, in chronological order in terms of whose idea was 360, what was, uh, uh, I'm sorry, not 360, Electra, Electracast. And uh, tell us about yourselves and how you came to do this and create a platform. What, a lot of us, is kind of mysterious. How do you create a platform? What, what, what was involved in that? Rafe, you want to start? Sure. So just for the record, can you hear me okay? Absolutely. Okay. So Rafe is my nickname. You had it right. It's Peter Rafelson. Oh. Um, you might know my last name because I'm the son of a famous film director, Bob Rafelson, who created The Monkeys and Easy Rider and many generations before that. Well, I confess, was... when, I, when I saw your name, your name on the frame, I thought, is that I must the have the guy, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like what? Yeah. And then, and then my my lineage includes uh, Samson Rafelson, who created the Jazz Singer back in the twenties, and many other films like Heaven Can Wait and great uh, Ernst Lubitsch movies. So I I come from a, a DNA uh, of of creators and somewhat pioneers. The first film was sound the first music video on television and the first independent uh, film to, you know, make number one at the box office. Uh, my, my earlier days were focused primarily on music. Uh, and, and, and that led me to, to developing labels, publishing records, uh, distribution, promotions, marketing, all the things that, help to, to, to create what we call the DIY, the do-it-yourself or the independent um, music industry. But in doing so, I built a number of studios, uh, oh gosh, nine or 10, and ran my business um, there for the last 25 years. About two years ago, 
Um, I, I, I reached out to a gentleman um, who's here today, Mark Netter, whose background had been in marketing, both um, to and from the studios. When I'd met him, he was wrapping up Warner Brothers uh, launch of DC Universe. And with his understanding of the market and having been a film director himself, and my understanding of the music industry and technology and all of my DNA, um, we came to the conclusion that uh, podcasting was an opportunity for the future, not just uh, as a, 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 a way to create new audio formats, but to really incubate rights that would extend way beyond just podcasting. Can, can uh, I ask, can I ask if though, can, when, when, did, when, when did you do this? Uh, well, we met about two years ago, and 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 we 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 are just about a year and a few months um, since our formation. So this all has happened recently. During, it's all it's all happened yeah. during shutdown, hasn't it? Well, ironically, um, and Mark will tell you this is. I mean, I I guess it's a blessing in a weird way. We we literally formed the corporation and opened up our bank account the week or the like the day before lockdown so so from these 14 studios that i own and where we were working in a commercial property we all went home closed our doors closed our you know shop up and we're able to scale this incredible new company um much like we're doing with you right now bob most of it is remote most of it is over zoom but the beauty is when people came to me and and i'm fascinated and honored to be in the presence of so many writers playwrights i i've, I've been in that world um a bit i i, I wrote and produced a, a full-blown high budget musical in in london on the west end and 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 what you guys all do is amazing to me but what what you said, Bob, rings true, which is uh, to find an opportunity to to develop and incubate those rights um, in a way that is possible with our own, you know, technology, our own home technology, and our own two hands, or basically um, our own our own resources, the, the re exactly, resources that, that are available to us. Exactly right. So I, I, gotta, and, I gotta and, actually say that I, how lucky you guys are that you were creating a a business that was so well positioned for the world that we were entering. It's crazy. I mean, I mean, I it's mean, insane. I, 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 Mark, Mark, and I, I, I scratch our heads all the time. And 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 here's what's really interesting, and I think this speaks to 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 what you're asking really about me to address. Um, in a, so so we we decided we came to the conclusion that there were basically three categories of of content that we were we were going to focus on, and the first one is just your typical podcast. It's talk radio. It's Joe Rogan. It's Howard Stern. It's you know Mark Maron. It's 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 interviews and it's it's basically uh, recorded live and and done in, in, a, in an interview type format. Um, the second one is an interesting one and it's the one we did first. And it is what we're calling refreshed content. We take previously existing TV shows, video, audio, things that were done never with the uh, concept of it being a podcast and refreshing it, turning it from a TV show into a podcast or a legacy show that was all interviews originally a talk show into a new format like uh, Johnny Carson now becomes a podcast that type of um, project and we did this first with a, a show that was very successfully distributed on Amazon called Tech Talk some of you may know it it's in 500 million homes as a video series but we went and took stripped all that audio and then turned it into something new, the Tech Talk podcast. The third category, which is the one that I think everyone here is gonna be most interested in, is the dramatic scripted series. And that is one that has actors or that is has written scripts, that is uh, narrative, that has got everything from historical do docu-series up to what are essentially produced as small films or small television shows. And what's fascinating is um, 
our first show in that category came to us as a script for a television series. And quite frankly, the, the, the actress who's, who, who, who took it upon herself to write and, and, and want to direct this thing um, said, Peter, can you help me get this thing shopped as a TV show? And I said, probably not. Jennifer Nash is her name. You've created a, an, an amazing show about the lives of friends during the pandemic and, and what becomes of them. And, and, and you, you've never done television before. What you do have is an incredible cast that you're able to talk to and, and reel in. I said, what we ought to do is create this as a podcast first, which I can guarantee will be made. I add the resources. It's, it's, it's not just a shot live. It's much more complicated, but we can, we have the technology, we can do this. And then once the thing exists as a podcast, we're able to then uh, shop it and build an audience and proof of life and proof of interest, and then go out to studios. Well, the irony is here we are, the, 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 the pandemic is almost over. The show is coming to completion as a podcast. Before this thing has even been in distribution, we're already getting inquiries from the television world about the rights to a television series. So with no further ado, I, I want to I want to let my, my my partner Mark talk to this because that's the world he comes from. But but it's fascinating to think that podcasts are the new incubator of film and TV. Look at look at you know Homecoming, uh, Dirty John, Lore, Crime, to all these shows on HBO, um, Amazon, Netflix. They all started as podcasts, and now they're big hit series. So, uh, before I want, I want to meet Mark. Uh, I just have a, a question. <clears throat> when you talk about your three hundred and sixty de uh, degree approach, um, how many points are mapped on this three hundred and sixty degrees? We, we, we basically we have a we have the, the the podcast, and we have that related to the visual visual medium. Um, what are the other What are the other pieces? That, it's a It's a great question, and 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 when we say three hundred and sixty, we mean all encompassing. I think the, the the differentiator for Mark and I is that when we created this company, we knew from the very get go that podcast was just an entry point, and 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 that meant that all of those ancillary rights, whether it be literary whether it be brand, whether it be retail, whether it be merchandise, whether it be film, television, live events, stage rights, all those additional IP, intellectual property rights that can be incubated and created based on that original copyright are on the table for us. That's why we call it the 360 play. And, and essentially, we had to build a portfolio of copyrights the same way a publisher or Disney has a portfolio and then they do all different versions of the, that IP. Um, that's, that's one thing that comes down to the rights, which is something I've learned from music my whole life. Mark understood the idea of, of reaching out to different aspects of the industry and together um, we're doing it. I mean, uh, I, I can't wait okay. to hear what, what Mark has to we're gonna to We're going to come back to this because this, this opens up a whole flood of questions. But I want to meet Mark. And I want Mark, Mark, I want you to tell us a little bit about your background and, and what life was like before before Rafe or Peter. <laughs> whether, he, whether he was Rafe or whether he was Peter then, in fact. Now, before Peter and I met, life was much duller, of course. It's much more exciting now. Uh, my background uh, is kind of varied. I've worked in television. I was a music supervisor for a number of Olympic broadcasts. I worked in feature filmmaking when I moved from New York to Los Angeles and worked for producers and directors on several features. I got kind of dragged into the or, in, or seduced into the video game business for a while up in San Francisco and worked on a number of titles, including Tetris, which I think is probably the one everybody knows the best. And then I came back to LA and I uh, eventually started working in entertainment advertising. And I spent so, 17 years working. Wait, wait, I just have to say, so I have you to blame for Tetris. Uh, I was well, an addict. Completely. I was I an didn't addict. Create it. <laughs> no, I do know Alexi Pagetnoff, the creator, and you can blame Alexi, um, who, who 
figured some stuff out about Tetris that was pretty interesting, including the fact that having by having blocks of four, you can create seven different shapes. And that's about what the human mind can can manage to remember is seven different objects. So, I couldn't handle that many, but okay. But, well, if you were addicted, then that was the reason. So at any case, I started working in entertainment advertising and I worked on the vendor side. So I've worked with all the major movie studios, all the broadcast networks, uh, many cable networks and video game companies, um, uh, tech companies. And uh, towards the end of you know, my time working in entertainment advertising, I took a job uh, on the client side, helping to launch DC Universe at Warner Brothers. And that was a lot of fun. Uh, and that's when Peter and I connected um, it was right around the time I started teaching marketing at Los Angeles Film School uh, a few nights a week as well. And what I, we found was that Peter was a, not only has, you know, incredible skills in terms of audio and music, but it, in rights and really understanding rights. And, you know, he's emphasized that a lot, so I won't cover that same ground. But there's things that we can do that we are doing, like making soundtrack albums out of the, the music from our podcasts. Uh, using Spotify as a tool for creating related um, uh, playlists that can help us with search and discovery. Uh, it's it, we're we're right now we've basically been making this out of nothing, and we have uh, including a lot of my former students working for us in internship roles. But we've been able to put together three podcasts, which I'll actually drop into chat right now, The uh, at least the Apple links for them. Guys, have, by the way, I should ask you this. Uh, do you want me to make you co-host? Do you want to do any screen shares? Uh, I don't need to at the moment. Um, I, I yeah, Potentially, you know, I could I could show you kind of our where we are on Instagram so you can get a visual picture of what we're doing. So um, I can bring that up over here because I'd love to tell you, I mean, I'll tell you kind of basically where we are in terms of what we've created and what we have coming up. So we have three podcasts, which I'll, I'll, I'll definitely do the Instagram share with you guys. Uh, give me one sec to bring it up. And we have another seven, no, pardon me, another nine. We just signed another deal. We have nine that were in development or actual production on of which I think four will be out within the next three months, including the dramatic one that, that Peter brought up. And I wanna to mention too, that our dramatic podcast is called The Last Saturday Night, and it stars Sherilyn Fenn from Twin Peaks, Gilmore Girls, Shameless, Eric Roberts, Ed Asner, who I learned over the course of working on this. You're gonna gloss more... over Eric Roberts? I know, Eric <laughs> Roberts is a big deal. Um, especially those of us who remember the Pope of Greenwich Village. and. Uh, and then we have Ed Asner, who I, I have learned has more acting Emmys than any other man alive. So, and-, and At uh, age 92, have, still strong. Still strong, still still strong, still flirty, my understanding as well. <laughs> and uh, Jennifer Elise Cox, who has been on web therapy. I'm sorry, my dog is going nuts over here. And uh, so anyway, we're very excited about what we're creating. And, and I wanna say too, that for folks that are playwrights, I think there is opportunity in podcasting to get your material out there. And uh, particularly if you can make it, uh, if it's something that's, you know, you, you perceive as being visual, but you can make it something that is uh, works in audio. And, and there are lots of ways to do that. There's different, different kinds of tricks and things that you can do. I think it's, it's real interesting. Well, it looks I, like we have a, may I, a may question, I just say by the way. You know, we do have a question, but I'll get to Paul in a second. I just yeah. want to say that I, what I want to actually start talking about is um, how you are making it possible for writers and producers to think in a different way, um, to think in a multi-tiered way. So uh, a lot of a lot of development paths um, are we, I mean, we we know we know sort of like the the areas that we're going to touch on when we're developing and, and where we might go in terms of sus subsidiary rights but you're actually opening up some other thought paths for people that's, that's uh, right and 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 i think i think that what what um mark and i are doing especially of late is particularly apropos for this and that is that in addition to partnering whether it be with a brand or a creator or a host, or a writer, or a producer of a podcast per se, we're also developing the ECM, Electrocast Media Networks. And the networks are an opportunity 
for us to sign on creators like all the people on this podcast right, or on this webinar right now who have properties of their own that wish to gain exposure, that are self-starters, that may not even realize that their own plays can become podcasts, much like that's how plays were originally shared. Remember, old-time radio was basically radio plays. So for all of you who are interested in a home that understands and supports and respects the creator first, that's part of our culture, our corporate culture, we would be very interested in knowing whether any of you are, are, have even thought about uh, uh, being able to take your, your writings and present them in an audio form. And if so, um, we welcome the opportunity to, to talk about how that relationship would look with the ECM networks. Our networks are, think of them as verticals, verticals in particular areas. The first few that we're starting with are female empowerment. This is a, a psychographic market segment. Business, tech and business, geopolitical. Uh, we've talked about developing uh, some subgenres of, of networks. But one, ironically, one of the ones that we, we've, Mark and I have talked about, and we actually looked into this for a while, was something to do with Broadway. Well, needless to say, that was poo-pooed the moment, you know, everything shut down. But as everybody here, I'm sure, is looking forward to the concept of sitting in a theater with other people, my God, foreign concept. Um, it's something that we would be, love to discuss and explore with 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 you and and consider yeah. if we if we have enough content um, creating that network. Yeah, and I just want to say, I mean, I believe that people listen to podcasts for three reasons. I think number one, especially with talk shows, people are listening for personalities. That there's people that they become attached to the same way TV originally worked, where you're inviting somebody family into your home, you know, once a week into your living room. Second thing is information. You know, people are listening to political podcasts and sometimes podcasts that are about a trade that they're in or a field that they're in. And the third is stories. And ideally, you have some combination of those things. And certainly with performance, you know, and with plays, you can have that sense of story and that sense of personality. But um, I think that's where, uh, you know, if you have very strong stories, potentially that can be serialized over the course of X number of podcasts, that can become something that is a it's a way to incubate those rights within those podcasts and we're interested in that. Let me, let me try to focus this a little bit for, I mean, other people may have the same questions that I have in my head. Um, is it fair, it's, it's, is it fair to say that, that your central idea for what you're doing is, is the podcast and then everything else grows out of that? Where, where, do, where does it start with you? Does it start at the podcast? Because well, yeah, your, 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 con your conversations have always revolved, they've always uh, come back to, to podcast. Yeah, so we're audio first. We're a podcast company. Okay. And part of that is that's a momentum play. You know, we're at a time where podcast companies are being acquired. We're at the time where podcast companies are making splashes in different ways. And it's a bit of a Wild West situation where people are trying all different things. There's some podcasts that are, you know, like Dan Carlin's Hardcore History that run for three hours and you have to listen to like, five episodes to get the whole story. There are other podcasts that are running five minutes and showing up every day with a, with a COVID update. So and more and more, the, the, I just want to add one thing, Bob, because uh, it's, it's sort of a misnomer podcast. Just for the record, everything Mark and I have released to date and are producing in-house all has video and is available in video streaming format in addition to audio yeah. I wouldn't say it's not every single series, but we try to focus on that for most of our series to do a video version of it just, in some way. Just, um, just to go back to definitions, just, just so you know, we've had many conversations over the past year about podcast. We've come to the conclusion that podcast is a medium. It's not necessarily a form. It's not a dramatic form. So, which is how what you sort of said, because it, it can be three, di three different things. You talked about um, stories, information, and personalities. Yeah. Um, right. So, so we, I think we we understand it at this point as podcast being just a medium that, that that we use, and we use it in any way that we want. It can be it can be a, a play, it can be an interview, it can be whatever. Um, it can also be visual. I mean, people, I, I, it's really not 
properly the, the 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 origin of the word pod came from the iPod, which was audio only. And then at some point the iPod did have a screen on it, and at some point there was some visuals, and you could watch video on an iPod. But but it, there, if you really want to be specific podcasts traditional audio podcasts which are on podcast platforms or applications are actually distributed through something called rss which stands for really simple syndication however ask anybody under the age of 30 or 25 where they consume podcasts and 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 inevitably they're going to tell you youtube which is a video format and it is an internet video streaming platform that they choose to watch and listen to what they're calling podcasts when you say that they're on youtube are you talking about actually physically acted out pieces or pieces that the, yeah, so that are audio that have that have uh, graphics that are that are just uh, yeah. The, there's two ways. Them. There's two ways that podcasts are showing up on YouTube. One of them is that the podcast is recorded with video over Zoom, for example, like our show uh, Nightmare Road Stories. And Nightmare Road Stories. Actually, let me share something with you guys right now because I want you to uh, since I have it up over here. I'd like to show you guys some of our uh, our shows and the one that I'm talking about right now. I can start with. With first, so Nightmare Road Stories is a there's a, a very very funny stand-up comedian Alicia Cooper. Alicia has been working in the business for 20 years, and I think she's poised to become an overnight success after 20 years in the business. Right. She's also a writer. She's a director. She's got a very funny short film out called Fat Stripper that she wrote and directed and stars in, and. She invites guests on like Antoine Scott, like Roy Wood Jr. here from The Daily Show. Next episode we have coming up is with Lunell, who's been an African-American stand-up comic who's been around for, for years. Many of movie. you may remember George Wallace. Right. So she's in like Coming to America, things like that. And what Alicia does is she invites the guests on and they, they, you kind of feel like you're at the table at the Laugh Factory after they performed, listening to them doing insider chat, you know, really talking to each other, cracking each other up the way that comics do. And she always brings it around to what is your craziest story of your experiences touring on the road? So that's the format of that particular show. But, but, but in all fairness, we are taking visual clips of the guests performing mm -hmm. that is not shot live. And we're also editing editing that into what is the video version of this podcast so when you listen to it through earphones and you're not watching it's an interview show with clips that you would hear of a performance but when you're watching it you might even see live performances at the apollo theater or god knows where um and that's combined and and edited in with what we're seeing of each other right now, which is these live interviews with visual talking ads. Yeah. And let me just, okay, I, I don't know about- uh, I'm, gonna, to I'm gonna get to Paul's question in a second, but yeah. I haven't forgotten him. I, I wanted to also show you guys, just quickly give you a glance at the range of what we're doing. And then I have one other thing that I wanna say about scripted shows before we go on to the questions, because I think this is, this is kind of useful and important. So as Peter mentioned, our very first series is called Tech Talk, the Tech Talk uh, podcast where about to rebrand it as Tech Talk Revolution for SEO reasons and search reasons. But essentially this is a show that exists on video first. So we don't do our, our own video version of it. Although as you can see, it gave us a wealth of material to use for marketing on Instagram. And we basically stripped it for audio and had hosts, Johnny Kaplan and Jesse Katz, re-record new intros and outros in order to make it a podcast, uh, to make it feel like a podcast and not like a TV show. And there's certain places where they had to uh, do some narration over things that were particularly visual. So this is an example of a refresh series that gives us a very high production value based on the original sound recording. And our third series is, that's out is called The New Feminist. And this is with the incredible Jill Sorensen. She's been known as a model. She's the co-founder of an anti-domestic violence nonprofit called Knockout Abuse, which has both East Coast and West Coast branches. 
And she has, she's really into the idea of common sense feminism. And we have episodes that include, uh, the first episode is a fashion me too with supermodels Carrie Otis and Eva Carlson talking about Harvey Weinstein type behavior that they uh, both experienced and saw other women, mo young models experience in the business. Second episode is with Gail Dines and it's all about porn culture and how pornography as an aesthetic has infiltrated our entire culture and what, what that means. And the third one's a really kind of fun episode as Jill likes to say, compared to the first two, Myths and Movies. And that's the one that just came out about a week ago. And this one is a one where she flips the script by taking scenes from like Game of Thrones or Pretty Woman, having men read the female parts and women read the male parts to show uh, the, uh, I guess the inherent sexism inside of entertainment that we've all kind of accepted for decades as being A-OK. -okay. So this is kind of the range that we're working in here. And one thing that I did want to say about the scripted podcast is, uh, and, and to your point, Bob, about it being a medium as opposed to a, a, a form, you know, when we talk about film, you can have film noir, you can have action films, there's all different kinds of film forms. But in a in documentary, script, documentary, you know, it's a, right. And same thing, exactly the same thing in scripted. There are scripted documentary series like Serial, which was incredibly popular, where they're trying to find out if this guy really killed this young woman or is he innocent? Was he set up? You know, what happened? And then you have fictional podcasts. You have podcasts that uh, feel like just, just somebody, a narrator telling you a ghost story. I was a, on a long drive listening to several of those a little while ago and getting chilled to the bone. So there's so much room for creativity within this medium. And the two things about it that are both they're the good and the bad. The great thing about it is the low barrier to entry just like with film these days and, and YouTube, you know, you can get material, you can make something inexpensively and you can get it, get it published. You can get it out there. Now the question is discovery. How do you get people to come to your material and to find it? And that's where things become important that, you know, I think we've all dealt with in the arts of, do you have talent that has a big following on Instagram? Do they have a hundred thousand followers? Do they have 500,000? Do they have a million followers? Can we get three, one to 3% of those followers to listen to this podcast on a regular basis? What's the aggregate? Um, if we have guests on the show, are they going to give us a big boost that particular week? And is there a way we can sustain that boost over the weeks ahead? So those are the issues that we deal with. It's, it's low barrier to entry. It's um, a lot of in the marketplace. So discovery is an issue. And you have to do things that make you stand out and figure out how to get people to pay attention. Well, guess what, Mark? You just got yourself invited to be on our next marketing panel. <laughs> right. You welcome it. Um, I'd love to answer the question. I know Paul's been really patient. So yeah, Paul. Uh, what was the, Can you repeat the question? He hasn't said it yet. I don't know if we've driven him off by taking too long. Paul, are you there? Actually, actually, it's for our guest. It's uh, not really a question. I was just going to mention. You know, on my desk, I have this green book. It's called The Human Nature of Playwriting, written by a gentleman named Samson Rachelson, full of ah. tidbits, new words like tragedy farce. And most of all, I remember he saying that everything you write should have a point. By point, I mean, you can't just write gaga. So it's a collection of his, of his talks from, I guess, University of Illinois in 1948. It's, 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 wow. it's a lovely book that I've clearly kept over the years. And, and so... I'm oh, going to thank him for the book. Yeah. You, uh, well, that's my great uncle. And, and, and yeah, what an incredible uh, impact he, he had on all of us, um, you know, whether we knew it or not. But, uh, you know, I, I think what Mark is speaking to applies to everything that this community does and, 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 and wants. And that is um, compelling. Um, attention really is, 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 is there's, a, there's a term, the attention economy. Everybody's fighting for your attention now. And, and, and it's most obvious when you go online and things are popping up. And it used to be that you were fighting for attention within a certain market, but that's no longer the case. Um, there are insurance companies fighting against a TV show for your attention online. It, it, it's, it's, it's advertisers at large. And if you fall into a certain category or a demographic or a market segment, you're going to be hit by anybody and everybody wanting your 
attention, your, you as a customer. Uh, this applies to your plays as well. I mean, I, I, I can only tell you that having been through a, a high budget production in London, getting that attention, uh, the controversy, the star fuckers, excuse my French, all of the British uh, periodicals and uh, magazines that wanted to write about Jack Nicholson and Princess Di and Andrew Lloyd Webber and, and who showed up that night at the play, which I was very lucky uh, uh, to, to have, really helped to, to, to promote and, and to market something that otherwise would have just been another musical on the West End, most of them open and close in three weeks. So, so one of the things that I wanted to say that I think Mark, Mark began to touch on, but it's something that would maybe ring true for a lot of you is, we see Electric Cast Networks as a chance to cross promote and to create exposure for everything on that network to a much broader audience. When you're an island and you're strictly alone in your basement with a microphone and you have to get this out there and the only place your name appears is in one podcast it's hard to expect that a lot of people millions of people are going to know about it whereas if you're part of a network you can actually gain exposure to every single podcast that the, the, the audience that's that's listening to every single podcast on that network. And that's something that we we really push strongly as a value to our partners and to our podcast providers and to the owners that appear on to all the you know the content on that network. If if we have a network that has 50 podcasts that are all about playwriting or bro or Broadway or acting or or uh, the entertainment industry and each of you have a show that can be advertised across 50 other shows you've got to assume that you're going to reach more people than if you're functioning in a vacuum and trying to do it by yourself being an island so yeah, wanna, that I wanna, is I wanna nature go, i want to go a little uh, to uh, back a little bit um because there are a lot of questions in the room but what i wanted to clarify was uh, this is not a room just of writers we, we also have producers here so a lot of them are are wondering right now what is their relationship to to you uh if a if a writer brings the property to you do you produce it for them uh, what happens if a producer has a property and they want they want to use your resources? How does that happen, or does that if that does that happen? Yeah, here's what I would say. I mean, for us, what we put our resources in, we're extremely careful about. So it has to be something that we can see a path to attention to discovery. Um, and but there's different levels to where we can be involved. So if a producer comes to us and has the capability for putting together talent, for putting together. Um, potentially, you know, recording sessions, maybe even an editor, you know, we can help with the entire process. We can help with figuring out uh, what the order of things is to do, what the formats of the show should be. We can, we will certainly be involved with the, if we sign on, uh, you know, to be involved with the marketing, to be involved and obviously dealing with the distribution. So, so basically, let me ask you this. Is, is, is there a, med, people, this is just a perfectly pr practical point thing. If, if, if you are a resource that people want to use, do you offer a menu of services and, and they get to, they say, oh, I need this, this, and this. I can do this. I can bring uh, you this. I mean, how do you do it? How does it well, work? Essentially, we can offer a menu of services. We don't have a, a stand-up menu that's got, you know, for example, pricing on it if someone's hiring us to do various things. So we have had several companies hire us to create podcasts. Uh, and that's been really, uh, really interesting process. So this is an, it's, an, it's an important, dis it's an important yeah. distinction. I just want everybody to understand yeah, that you you can be the one stop shop for things. So people can bring we it to are, you if you're yeah, interested in the project. You yeah, can let me explain, that, Peter. Let me explain. There's basically three ways people can work with us. Okay, good. One way is that it's a paid partnership. You come to us and you say, "Hey, we want you to help us put out this podcast. We want you to help with the editing. We want you to help with everything along the way, even the recording." and we settle on what that would cost and we share in the rights and recoup together and that's fantastic second way is you come to us and you're like i've got this great package here and it is premium 
uh, all the material that, you know, this is going to have uh, several well-known actors in it or talent of some sort, or perhaps the playwright is well-known, anything that would get us attention that gets us to go, okay, we will invest our own resources in this and co-own this with you. We will co-own the copyright because we won't do it without that, you know, unless it's a paid partnership. And even in those cases, we're co-owning the copyright. And what that enables us to do, by the way, is to uh, be able to be set up for exploitation in other media. So if we're putting a play on uh, in a 10 part series, 15 minute episodes each, for example, on Electricast, but the idea is we ultimately would want to get Netflix attention and see if we can turn this into a series. That's why we set things up this way. So you have the paid, you have the uh, premium, and then the third way is Electricast Networks. And the way that works is your podcast is completely independent. You've created it yourself and it fits into one of the networks that we've created, or maybe we create the network together, which has a enough podcasts in it that collectively their listenership will attract advertising that can play across the entire network. And it's a very different play because it's much more low touch for us. We teach you how to upload. We give you pointers and how to do things right but we're not editing, you know, we're not casting, we're not doing pre-production. We are strictly there to help you be part of the network, to monetize, to cross promote on the network. And, to... and, 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 and we do provide a network lead, which is somebody at our company who can help to guide you and answer questions and offer expertise and give you advice and potentially offer tools. And if you are short on, on uh, personnel, we can, refer you to some of our 40 plus editors and such, but we are not responsible for delivering the content. That would be the producer. So say if there's a producer on this uh, webinar and they reach out to a writer who's on this webinar and the two of you decide we're gonna work together and we wanna create something for ECM networks, then what is the next step? Well, aside from understanding the format of podcasting, right, and, and preparing a script, you would want to make sure that you're able to cast, record, edit, sweeten, if need be, that's effects and music. Um, and then of course, do the final mixing and then bring it back to us and give us some ads for the show that we can now start to run across the whole network. Now you're coming to us the way you might go to a major television broadcaster and you're the production company. We don't tell you what you can or can't do. We offer help, but ultimately you're independent and we're running your show and we're marketing and we're paying you anytime your show gets a little piece of that advertising income that the network receives. So that was one of the questions was how do, how do you monetize this and how do we monetize it? So you're saying that a lot of your income depends on, on advertising. Uh, people who, who subscribe to your network, are they paying anything? Right now we don't have anything set up with Patreon or anything like that, but we are okay. looking into it. Right. So essentially there's, it, it's, I don't know how knowledgeable folks are about advertising and I won't go into too much detail, but there's a CPM model, which basically means for every thousand impressions, every thousand listens to an ad, X amount gets paid. That could be ten dollars. That could be twenty-five dollars. That could be a hundred dollars. It depends. Mm -hmm. If it's EV, it could be thousands of dollars. But in, in any case, that's essentially how it works. And so it's really about building up an audience. And one thing, another thing that I'm going to say uh, that I think is helpful also for, you know, maybe provide some hope, is that um, podcasts that are uh, that are about contemporary subjects like uh, politics, for example, those podcasts have to make all of their impressions, all their money really within the first week to 30 days. They call it 60 days for the beginning window. But if you're listening to say Pod Save America to find out what's happening in democratic politics, um, the episode from a week ago Tuesday is probably not interesting to you. The episode from yesterday may still be of interest, but you know, events are gonna outstrip it within a couple of days. With uh, certain podcasts that are scripted, that are stories, you can have a long tail. You can create essentially what's an evergreen podcast, like uh, the Homecoming podcast Peter mentioned earlier, which was on from Gimlet Media, starred Catherine Keener, David Schwimmer, Oscar Isaacs, then went on to become an uh, Amazon Prime series with Julia Roberts. 
and uh, it's now show, running for years. For years, it's still popular. Yeah, the podcast is still that podcast is still making money. Maybe not as much as it did at the beginning, but because it's not topical material and it's good storytelling, and it probably got a boost from the TV show, it's a way to keep going. Terrific. Uh, th th this has been very, very helpful for me, and I, I think for the room as well. We have a lot of questions, um, but um, Jesse, I'm going to ask you to go through the chat and find the questions, but let me start with George Fuhrman because he has his hand raised. Yes. Um, <clears throat> so I had a question. The um, I, I was involved in this uh, scam where I lost a lot of money, and I, what I wanted to do was to produce a because um, I wrote the script and I wanted to produce what I feel is like a cautionary tale and then offer it in whatever venues I can for free, um, you know, just so people get educated about the way that, you know, um, many people are getting scammed and uh, there's very little to do with about that. And I just wondered if this kind of medium was appropriate for that kind of a thing. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, sure. I mean, the 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 key. I, I, first of all, I I like this idea. Um, the 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 key to having impact and helping is is to reach as many people as you can. Now, some people say, if I can just reach one person, um, I've I'm, my my work is done. Okay, that may be true, but. Can you afford to spend your your you know time of day mm -hmm. trying to reach just one person, or do you want right. to try to reach as many as you can? Right. So, so, so the, the the first thing I would ask myself if I were in your shoes is, what is it, what value, and what message is it that I can create in a way that attracts? interest uh what what do you search for online when you when you are in i've been scammed and i want to search for something to protect myself and the, and and when i enter that search term what i'm hoping is that is it george yes george's yes. podcast shows up as 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 something that might help me uh, protect my my myself from being scammed again or or ever so, so when you think about it, it's a great medium podcast, um, and there are all kinds. I bet if you've never done it, mm -hmm. check out the word scam in what what kind of phone do you have? An iPhone, an, an yes. Android? An okay. iPhone. Okay, so there's, I don't know if you've ever used it, but every mm -hmm. iPhone has a great app called Podcast. And mm -hmm. if you just search in that app, you'll right. see countless i bet countless shows that that involve it. now how do you stand out well that's a separate discussion but <clears throat> you want something that everyone's searching for so worst scams in history best scams in history god knows what that might be but this is where my partner mark and i uh, grapple a lot with with what it is that that is discoverable what discovery and searchability is a big part of this of this uh, impact that we want to make. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, thank you. <clears throat> okay, um, well, let's see. I, there's a question from Eric uh, uh, er, Rothman from earlier. Can you talk about the money balance and the IP rights? Who gets what? Creators cast you, your partners. You've actually touched on that, but can we clarify that just again? Well, I, I'm not going to get into specific percentages because I just don't, you know, it really depends on who we're making a deal with and what it's about. Um, we tend to, you know, want to have at least half of the uh, of the control, if not more, uh, in these situations. But it is that, really that's, about who's that's, contributing yeah. was, and, and that's it really not... is about is someone bringing something to the table that is so huge that you know. I, I mean, I, here I'll throw something out there. If Brad Pitt were to come to us and want to do a podcast, we would make terms very favorable to Brad Pitt. But, but what Mark is talking about is uh, he's talking specifically about the premium podcast that we are responsible for producing. The network shows, which were strictly broadcasting and marketing, 
that's a completely different model. And we don't, we don't insist on owning your IP. We, we may help to exploit your IP, in which case, of course, we would want to participate in that. But if you are simply coming to us and saying, I want to give you, I want, I want to provide a podcast to be distributed by you and marketed by you and monetized by ECM, that's not part of the standard agreement. Uh, if it's a paid podcast, hey, here's a million dollars to make a podcast and 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 you want to own it? I don't think so. Okay, so here's fifty dollars, and I, I I think Mark and I would say, okay, let's evaluate what value there is. What's the likelihood? We're very open, but 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 do understand one thing, and this is where my personal expertise comes from, the more chefs there are in the, in the ownership kitchen, the harder it is to make deals. So if there are 10 owners of a podcast, all it takes is one of them and the other nine lose out because one of them had a fight with somebody at Netflix in their childhood. I, I hate to use that as an extreme example, but I can tell you from a songwriter point of view, it happens all the time. The average hit song has five writers and seven publishers. Can you imagine trying to clear the rights to one silly song when you've got 12 parties you have to speak with? Oh, yeah, we're, we're familiar with those complications <laughs> very much so. Um, I have a question from Joe Nelms that I don't understand. Um, Joe, do you remember the question you asked? So how exactly did these guys get playwrights audience? Oh, get audience for the playwrights? Is that what it was? Joe, are you there? So, well, it's a great question. I don't know if Joe's there or not, but I, I, I understand it. What he's saying is, what can you do for me? And, and that's a great question. The, I think we touched on this. The goal is to amass as much traffic and volume collectively and then share that. And, and that's, that's true of whatever, whether it's playwrights or horse enthusiasts. There's a, there's a podcast network that's called the, the Horse Radio Network. And all they do are run shows about horses. And believe it or not, they've done extremely well. I'm talking they're netting millions of dollars a year because every single listener of any one of their podcasts on that network has a like-minded interest, which is horses. So guess what? All the advertisers know exactly who they're advertising to. And if you're selling saddles or boots or tackle or feed, you want to be on the horse network. Same thing with playwrights. Okay. Um, Lee Roscoe wants to know how to connect with your organization. I don't think we've ever been clear about that. So. What, what do they do? Who do they, who do they email? How do, they, email, approach, how do they, they approach you? Best thing is to email both Peter and myself, since it's really important that we as partners cover for each other in all things. So uh, I would say email Mark at electrocast.com and Peter at electrocast.com. Okay. And again, this may, this may have been covered, but may, may not, may not have been answered completely. Jane Dubin wants to know, well, the, this this is a, this is a similar question that you've answered already. But are you acting as co-producer as a service provider? And that really depends on the relationship that that we again, make. I just you. want to reiterate: there's three potential relationships with us. One is a premium podcast relationship where we're co-owners or owners of the copyright, and are heavily involved with the production post-production. Second is paid partnership where we're being paid to be uh, essentially help and to create. And the third is be part of Electrocast Networks where you're basically signing up, you're gonna do everything yourself, but you wanna be part of a larger network that is targeted towards specific advertisers, advertising uh, verticals. And the other half of her question is, do you retain future, we just lost Rafe. Um, uh, do you wanna retain future, do you, do you retain future rights in other media? Yeah, I mean the whole point, again, three different relationships, right? But in anything where we, take a copyright position that is uh, in perpetuity. We want to be helping everybody to earn off of that property for as long as humanly possible. I don't know enough about this to know whether this is a question that has a good answer from you, but uh, Lee Roscoe wants to know, so what makes them different than old fashioned syndicators? 
I, I don't know what that means. I'm not sure. No, I, well, on the net on the network side, th th there's no difference. The only difference is that the old fashioned syndicators don't do podcasts, right? But we do everything where we don't stop you're thinking podcasts. About like, talking about like syndicated television, because that's a whole different ball game where, you know. I think she but, must but, mean, he, he, uh, Lee, did, are you referring to television syndication? Un unmute yourself. Yeah. I um, can't get anybody so, to talk. <laughs> Okay, let me let me let me try to explain something because it's it's a question that that people have and may not understand. Um, so when when we use the term distribute podcasts, um, the way podcasts work is once they are online and available, they're available anywhere and everywhere that podcasts are served you're not limited to, unless it's a what's called a, a walled garden there are certain apps where where you can only get that podcast on that one app but we want as many instances of that podcast so when we distribute a podcast it's available on apple on amazon on iheart on spotify on android on google on TuneIn on any app or platform, so to speak, that serves podcasts. When we do video, obviously YouTube is gonna be the big one because that's where the majority of all video um, occurs. But we're also looking to serve to what are called OTT platforms. These are, are over the top um, services like Hulu or uh, various um, channels that that receive video feeds that aren't necessarily tied to a broadcaster or aren't tied to a specific service like direct TV or Comcast or cable network. We want to get your content in as many places as possible. Now we can't guarantee that every single one of those will accept that content. In fact, any, any broadcaster, the terms of service are, they have the right to deny running your content. You can't force your stuff onto somebody's channel, but we serve to them and we make it available to them. And, and, and the goal is to be a distributor um, and a provider of content, not just podcasts, but of content to as many places as possible. Thank you. Um, Arlene Corsano, um, do you wanna ask your question vocally? I'd, I'd love to hear somebody else's voice other than mine. Oh, okay. Here there I am. There you go. Okay. <laughs> so ask your question now. Well, um, I'm wondering about, uh, like I'm doing, a, I started a podcast and I need to add, you know, music to it. And it's, it's old stuff, not very, uh, you know, like big today, but maybe Louis Jordan or Ruth Brown or, you know, uh, Nat King Cole did. Um, and I'm wondering how, um, how Harry Fox deals with you, um, you know, such you a great question. I, I'm so glad you asked this because there has yet to be what is called a blanket license format for music and podcasts. And part of the reason is because podcasts don't pay royalties. So that means that when you have a podcast and you want to put someone else's music in it, you, you can't just t say, oh, it's good exposure for you and you get to collect the royalties that you would normally get if it were on the radio. Who would say no to putting your song on the radio? I would love for you to play my song on the radio. I make money from that. Doesn't work that way with podcasts. Now, traditionally, without getting too technical, the cost of running one download, which is called a mechanical royalty, that you would have to pay as the podcast owner is more than you could ever realistically make off that one download in a podcast, which basically means you'd be losing money every time you play your own podcast. So they don't deal you, with you, I guess. Well, they, they do, they do. But the key is to get a special type of license. And most of the record companies are not yet prepared to do this because they only are dealing with traditional licensing uh, uh, contracts that don't really work. Now, I will tell you one thing that's interesting. Um, and and it's, again, I'm glad you asked this question. So Mark and I have discovered 
that uh, more and more that the, the music aspects um, of the rights that we control um, are, are more and more valuable in the world of podcasting for that very reason. If you use something that's in the public domain, and by the way, some of those names that you mentioned may have uh, already expired the, the, the copyright so that they are in the public domain, you don't even need a license. It no, is, none it of is, them are, no. No, that goes back to 20, I think it's 1925 now, these little after that. It's, it's 75 years, so it's not currently, I think it's 1951 or something like that, or, or 40, 46, 1946. Um, uh, but but they but the, but they don't all fall under the same exact guideline because depending on when the copyright was originally created, it could be uh, life of uh, author plus thirty five years. It could be seventy five years, or there's a short window in the seventies between seventy eight and I think eighty one or something where there was a very specific life of copyright. But my point is every day. There are new copyrights that are being uh, that are falling into public domain. The Charleston is a great example, um, a great song, you know that that now is free for use. Um, but it's 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 a tough one. We we know an awful lot about this, and if you if you want to do this offline and have a chat about maybe helping how to license that music for your use, we'd be happy to talk with you. It's very nice of you. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Um, so, uh, what, there's one, one final question before we wrap up. Um, I, I guess, I guess the way I would ask it, Jane asked the question, um, what does your company do that's different from other companies? Are there any other, uh, other companies that have the same model as yours and how are you, how are you different from them? You know, every company at some level or another is looking to exploit beyond in any way they can. I think that the main difference is that we weren't the first to, to do this, but when we started doing this, we planned it to be a company that would in fact exploit the content beyond audio only. And it was something that was again, part of our company culture. Mark and I, uh, as much as we enjoy podcasting, we come from uh, both DNA and experience of the world of visual, audio visual. And, and I think that, that music, podcasting, film, direction, marketing, all of these things combined together puts us in a little bit different bucket than just the guys who say um, we're a podcast company. We, we are a media network company that produces, that aggregates, that distributes, that markets, and that monetizes. And those five things are, are, are generally broken apart by mo more, more small companies. We do all five of those. And I'm hoping that that's why people will look at us slightly differently. Well, thank you. Um, and Mark, you saw that they want people are asking for your contact information again. Although I'm good, I promise I'll send out the chat this time. I didn't do it last week. I'll send out the chat so, so you'll have everybody's contact information. I did drop that, drop our email addresses in there. So I saw, people have yeah. both of our email addresses now. Thanks for doing that. So no um, I want to thank you guys for being with us today and sharing uh, a wealth of information um, and a wealth of experience. And hey, Nice to nice to meet your DNA. It's like it's great DNA, very impressive. Um, thank you for for all that you've shared with us. And uh, I, I don't know if there are any other questions in the room. So I'm just going to do my little final spiel, which is basically, we do this for free, guys. If you want to come for free, you can come for free. But remember that uh, we have to run a business and we have to keep ourselves going. So donations are always welcome and encouraged. And you can always do that at TrueDonate, T-R-U-Donate.com. Um, and uh, that's it.